children, I'll tell you the news. Don't worry about the names or dates, you already know it's true. The doctor hates your baby, the prime minister's a ghost. And all them folks are sailing here, cause they're in love with both. Superfoods can save us from all our evil sin. JFK and Elvis own a bar in Wisconsin. And vaccinations were created by the CIA to steal votes from Bernie Sanders and turn your babies gay. So click the link you think you like and get tooled for a fight against those lefty fascist communists who are leaning too far right. Hi and welcome to Not Another Fake Newscast. I'm Paul. And I'm Jerry. And I'm Joe Trippershan, the guest. Yes, and uh, we're here with Joe. Joe is uh, an author, a producer, uh, director. He's a, a, a father and a husband, and uh, we're, we're very delighted to have him on the show today. Uh, so, Joe, I mean, you've done you've done many things in your career, Um but perhaps one of the most interesting is uh, is the time that you you spent in the Balkans in the nineties. So, would you like to give our listeners a, a bit of an insight into into that time of your life? Yeah, it's, it's one of these things that just falls into my lap and seems to happen to me uh, continually, you know, year after year. But in ninety seven, I was two years uh, out of a recent divorce. And I had uh, was getting close to bankruptcy uh, when I was introduced to this Croatian film and theater director. His name was Yakov, Yakov Sedlar. And uh, at that time, I had a production company, and Yakov had hired me to do some work on a, a documentary film, a travelogue about Croatia. So I, I helped him out, and then he came to me some months later and then asked me if I wanted to write a book for him. And that took me back by surprise. I said, well, tell me more about this book because I, you only know me through uh, working on this film for you. And he told me, yeah. yes, it's a really good book. It's, a, it's about our president. And we want you to write the official biography of our president, President Franjo Tudjman. And, um, and this was two years after the war. This is 97. And yeah. I was just like a typical American. I couldn't locate Croatia on a map, you know. Uh, so I said, uh, why did you want me to write this book? He says, well, you know, Dr. Tony recommended you. And Dr. Tony was a doctor that we shared. And that's how I was introduced to Yakov. And uh, Dr. Tony knew that I had recently published a book. But the book I had recently published was a humor book called The Official Alien Abductee's Handbook. So I was still curious why he, he wanted to hire me. Yeah. It was not a biography of another president of a, a Eastern European country. No, no. So it, that was the, like one of the most compelling questions that it took me a while to, to answer. And I'll, I'll give you a spoiler later on in our discussion. But I, I, I said, well, I don't know anything about Croatia or about uh, Tujman, the president. Give me the weekend and let me let me just think about it. So I did some research over the weekend. I found that uh, Tujman had came out ahead in the Balkan Wars of the 90s. He gained territory. He, he also ethnically cleansed uh, Croatia from uh, a lot of the Serb population and uh, was uh, at that time suspected to have been directly involved in the institution of the the death camps in, in Bosnia, the Croat uh, Bosnian death camps. So he was sort of like, you know, he, he wasn't as bad as Milosevic, but he certainly wasn't like a Mother Teresa. So I uh, come Monday, yeah. Monday morning, I call Yakov. I said, look, I, I really, I think you could find another author, you know, who can write this book for you. There's, we're in New York. There's lots of public relations firms. You know, why don't you hire one of them? He said, no, no, we want you, we want an authentic American voice. I said, well, you know, really, the only way if I can do that is if I have total editorial control. And, and no, I, I may be, you know, I may be critical. He says, no problem. I said, you'll sign an agreement to that? Yes, yes, I will yeah. pay you $40,000. I said, great, when do I go? <laughs> well, yeah, on the verge of bankruptcy, $40,000 must have seemed pretty sweet. 
It was, considering I was 50,000 in the holes. That was a big jump ahead. <laughs> I'm yeah. just writing an autobiography. I mean, like, you're just writing the story that already exists. There's very little creative input that's required at that point. You just have to, you know, tell the story that already is there. You don't have to come up with anything new. Yeah, well, that's what I, I was convincing myself that I could do. Yeah. I convinced myself that, sure, I'd be able to just go through things and cut and paste and, you know, interview some people and put together a biography and, and, and they'll like it. But, you know, what I was hiding from myself, because I really wanted to go, not just to make the money, but I also, as being a recently divorced man, I was interested in beating some, you know, some foreign women. Um, so I convinced myself that I could do this job. I could convince myself I could walk the line between delivering what they hope to receive and delivering what I could live with having my name on and not being yeah. recognized as a as a paid propagandist. But then yeah. I landed in, in Zagreb and things got more complicated. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I guess, I guess you, my my first thought when when you initially sort of told me this story was that you know, it's 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 nice to have the idea that you would be able to go and uncover the truth and that people would be happy to go on record and, and tell you what they thought about this band, but um, it's not necessarily going to be the case that the public are going to be willing to be critical of a man who's uh, sort of famous for being a, a, a bit of a badass and, you know, and, and locking people up in death camps. What a death camp guy. It's very difficult to convince people to talk out against the death camps guy. It was, uh, well, it it's, well in Russia, for example. It, it depends, you know, it depends on, on uh, who you are and, and uh, where you live and your opinion. I mean, I, I want to be really clear. I don't see, and I still don't see Twitchman as a, as a dictator. He's more of an authoritarian. Uh, so what, mm -hmm. what happened in a very brief history lesson, as much condensed as I can, so what happened is that after Tito uh, died, Yugoslavia fell apart, and it was mostly instigated by uh, Slobodan Milosevic, who incited the Serb minority in Croatia to rebel. Uh, it was a power grab, basically. So there was a lot of political maneuvering uh, going on. And Slovenia, who which was much more homogeneous than uh, Croatia and, and Serbia and Bosnia, uh, they decided to, to get their independence first. And uh, Serbia said, this fight is not worth it. Slovenia is too small. They're not on the coast like Croatia is. Uh, and so they just let them uh, succeed and become independent. But because uh, there was a lot of repression that Tito did, uh, all of the ethnic, uh, you know, ethnic populations in Yugoslavia, uh, there was a lot of nationalism boiling beneath the surface. So what happened is that uh, Milosevic, uh, a Tujman of Croatia, and uh, Izabekovic of Bosnia Herzegovina, all became. Uh, overnight nationalists with, before they were communists. Uh, so Croatia did this because there was a strong trend of nationalism and it was being led by Franco Tuđman. And you can debate whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and I'm not going to weigh in on that. I can weigh in on, on his actions, though. So what uh, I did find is that for people who consider Tuđman uh, a war criminal, uh, there are just as many people who consider him a war hero, and even more so when you looked at the people who had been uh, sent to the International War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, the people who were indicted, you'll find a lot of strong supporters. They're considered war heroes because they defended their country. Well, it's that whole the one man terrorist is another man's freedom fighter like thing where, depending on what side of the fence you sit on, it depends exactly. on how you view that, 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 those actions. Exactly. It's a dichotomy. Yeah, and so, and so before I get into you know, bad things that I think that Tuchman did, I mean, you can read about this. This is, this is no secret. But at the time, um, there wasn't really hard proof about his direct connection to the death camps in Bosnia. But he basically had a vision of, a, of an expanded Croatia, a greater Croatia, uh, one that was you know, ethnically pure. Uh, but he did at all times try to negotiate for peace. 
Uh, some people, some critics will say he had to because he didn't really have access to the Yugoslav army the way that the Serbs did. Because when the Serbs uh, started to instigate uh, rebellion in Croatia, they had control over the Yugoslav army, the outpost, the ammunition, the weapons, etc., uh, helicopters, jet fighters, etc. Uh, but uh, Tudman did continually try to negotiate a peace. Uh, and uh, there was a strong connection, a stronger connection between Milosevic and Tudjman than there was certainly between uh, Tudjman and, and, and the Bosnians. And uh, that is when the war started to get uh, really nasty, uh, when it spilled over to Bosnia, when Bosnia decided to, to, uh, to declare their independence, because here as Bosnia was, was caught, they were landlocked and were caught between these two forces. And so at one point, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosnians were all fighting against each other. And that was the height, the height of the war. And so it took a while for the international community to try to you know, come together to stop the humanitarian crisis because America didn't see any uh, interest they had in there. They were still mopping up after the first Gulf War. And uh, the European community uh, didn't want to get their, you know, uh, their soldiers uh, involved in a, another confrontation because they remembered how the uh, the first world war, war, war started. So uh, yeah. this is this was the situation I was I was facing. I was interviewing a lot of uh, politicians day after day. Never have I been lied to by so many people in such a short period of time, and and, and they all wanted to explain to me uh, very calmly about how. The, the true cause of ethnic rivalry this started only recently back in the 11th century. So these are people with long memories yeah, and strong opinions. And I, I guess, you know, when we, we look at a lot of, a lot of rivalries, a, a lot of uh, war that has been fought, terrorism, tribal uh, kind of battles, if you if you look at Northern Ireland, if you look at Palestine, the Gaza Strip, um, often times there's there's real historic bad blood that that goes back generations and centuries between villages and you know places that are quite close together mm-hmm. as well. Well, well, I mean, if you take um, main European countries, like they don't war anymore, but there's still a underlying colonial bad blood between like. You know, Spain and Portugal and like Holland and France and you know because there's always been there's have been hundreds of years of hating each other and fighting across land that like so if you can imagine in a hostile area that's happening all the time for a long period of time like um, it never goes away like like you said like Northern Ireland. I mean, historically in Europe, the post-war period's an anomaly. Really, you yeah. know the the the, e, the EU's been incredibly successful in um, creating lasting peace, certainly in in Central Europe. Obviously, with the with the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and what happened in Yugoslavia, there's there's been some more issues in Eastern Europe. So so you you arrive there, um, you arrive there, Joe. You know what was your what was your kind of first experience of 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 arriving in the Balkans? Uh, well. Zagreb is a very, uh, it's a very beautiful city. It's very quaint. It reminded me of uh, Vienna a little bit, some of the architecture. Uh, and, um, and the people there were, were friendly but suspicious. I mean, it's a small country in terms of people knowing each other. Like one of the first things I did after I um, made my presence known to the American embassy uh, was to make a phone call to some people uh, that I wanted to interview. Uh, these were people that were off the official interview book that uh, Yakov Sedlar, the man who hired me, wanted me to to interview. But he didn't stop me from interviewing other people. Uh, so I did, and I called up someone, uh, and I said, uh, I'd like to speak with Vlado, please. This is Joe Trippishin. And they said, oh, yes, Mr. Joe Trippishin. We heard you were here. We were wondering when you'd call. I said, I didn't tell anyone I was here. He said, yes, we know. Welcome to Croatia. Literally, I'm not making this up. This is what happened. So, yeah. so it started off with a little bit of paranoia, but I thought, oh, it's, it's fine. I'll, I'll be fine. I had 
I had hired a researcher back in New York who would send me briefings on the people I'm interviewing and uh, and uh, sample questions. And then I was off. I had another contact also from New York who was uh, on the other side of the equation. He was more like a communist, a dissident, and he got uh, basically he. He got uh, asylum to uh, to live in the United States because he was persecuted for what he wrote and what he published. And so from him, I got contacts on the other side of the equation. So uh, as I said, uh, the people I interviewed from the, the Croatian government, uh, they were very dry. Uh, but some of them later on turned out to be war criminals. I remember one general I interviewed, uh, I had, uh, who later became uh, indicted, uh, he said to me, he says, I want to see your list of questions. I said, no, I'm not showing you my list of questions. Why do you want to see that? He says, I want to know what you're going to fire at me ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, after the interview, he, uh, he said, uh, this is my book. I want you to have my book. He made, it was like a 700-page book, hardbound. I said, thank you very much. And he says, that'll be $50, please. So <laughs> these are the kinds of things I remembered. Uh, but at, yeah. at the, but during this whole thing, in, in between my time trying to you know meet uh, you know Croatian and Bosnian women, I was trying to get to the heart of the story. I was trying to do because I I was really impartial. I didn't have you know uh, uh, a say in the fight. I just didn't want to be known as a paid propaganda. So I wanted to try try to find what was true about this because there was a lot of propaganda against Croatian against Tudjman. Uh, by the Serbs, you know, and if you look at yeah. at if, if people want to gauge, okay, who's the biggest criminal, who started this, and you know, who did the most war crimes, whatever. Um, the United Nations published a report some years ago said that ninety percent of the war crimes committed in the Balkan Wars of the nineties were committed by the Serbs, followed by uh, the Croatians, followed by uh, the Bosnians, and the only reason for the disparity is. The, the lack of opportunity the Bosnians and the Croatians had. As I mentioned before, the Serbians had control of the former Yugoslav army and all its weapons yeah. and aircraft and tanks. Uh, so, and, and, and each one of these um, you know, countries or their leaders, the leaders who mostly instigated the war, mm -hmm. uh, culpability lies with Milosevic first, Tojman second, Isabekovic third, if you want to rank this like a soccer game, uh, was that uh, they all also had their own propaganda machines, uh, yeah. whether it was public relations or whether it was what I was hired to do was to write an official biography, uh, a hagiography, a glowing book about Tujman. So I was really concerned about not being known as a propagandist, but also uh, not, you know, not being fair, you know, and accurate, truthful. Yeah. So it was it was hard to, to get that, but I did find you know uh, some uh, deep throat characters who who, uh, who spoke about it, and then the one who really nailed it for me was wasn't in the Balkans. It was in back in New York, back in my hometown. It was Richard Holbrook, uh, the, the diplomat who, assistant Secretary of State, who who fashioned the Dayton Peace Accords, who was brought into the the killing. Uh, right. He said to me that. So, um, Served under Clinton, that would be. Yes, right, it was yeah. in Clinton, and this was right when I came back. Uh, I ran into him at a uh, at the Waldorf Astoria, where they were holding a ceremony for the Committee to Protect Journalists, and this was a uh, they're honoring one of the Croatian journalists. So I saw my opportunity right before the event began. I, I noticed uh, Holbrook and walked up to him. I said, I'm doing this biography of Tujman. I'd like to interview you. He says, this is a great idea. Tujman was key to the Dayton Peace Accords. So right. again, as I say, you know, the, the things that, uh, that Tujman did during the war, uh, the bad things, setting up the, con the death camps and, uh, and letting the fighting go on, which is what Holbrook confirmed to me, uh, but at that time in '97, he confirmed to me off the record. Uh, he confirmed to me that uh, that Tujman had never lived up to any peace agreement dealing with Bosnia because, you know, Tujman had this ideal of consuming Bosnia into Croatia for Greater Croatia, 
and um, and part of these ethnic cleansing routines were mostly, in Croatia's part, moving the population out of the territory uh, through bombing and acts of terror, but uh, th- through some peaceful means as well, and uh, and also through the less peaceful means. So that was his vision, and uh, and after. The war ended. Uh, there was a lot of looting of uh, national uh, entities, national companies in Croatia, and there was uh, a heightening of the uh, ethnic tensions. So, and there was a split between, as I said, people who were considered uh, war criminals and people who were considered uh, war heroes. But the same people, it just depended if you were. Uh, you know, in in the city of Zagreb, or you were in the outskirts of the, the towns which saw most of the fighting, and so these people defended us. These people defended our. And then Tujman told me on the record, on video, on camera, uh, that uh, these people who consider war criminals uh, were only defending their homes, and and if they they went over bounds, you can't blame them. Uh, because of the, the revenge they wanted to, the revenge they were feeling, he said. Uh, so, so he came out and said that on, on the record. Yeah. Um, uh, so when you when you say that there was there was a kind of looting of um, the Croatian companies, etc., are we talking about a, a kind of creation of a? almost oligarchical class in, in a similar way to what happened in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yes, that's right. The, the Croatian Mafia, if it's called. Mm-hmm. And um, there's been a lot of uh, anti-corruption uh, initiatives happening in Croatia. It's still happening. Uh, the problem, with, with it stems from the way the, um, the Twitchman had put to, in place all of the reforms, so-called reforms, uh, but th- that is, you know, that's that's secondary to to the real story that I was I was digging into, which was why did they hire me, and why did they hire me to write this book? Why did they want this book? Okay, so yeah. it was a few years. It was only a few years, two years or so after what it ended. So I, I take it everyone was still quite. I mean, I know the war has ended, but it's only ended two years. And as you said, there's a oligarchy being created. There's people, there's a asset grab coming at the end of a war and stuff like that. So it must have been quite a tense environment that you were still in. Like people must have still been tiptoeing around quite a lot. Yeah, and these are and these are people who you know had for prior to the war. Uh, lived next to each other, neighbors and neighbors, intermarried each other, had children, had families together. And it took yeah. just about a year for the propaganda uh, and campaigns done by all of three countries to turn these people against each other. Okay, so the, the power the propaganda had back then was in television. It was before social media. And, and yeah. if they were to do that today, it would happen over, as you can see, these things are happening overnight. Yeah, that's there's definitely parallels with uh, with with the rise of uh, division or politically all over the kind of the Western world. Down in Brazil, obviously, you've got Bolsonaro down there. You know, we we can see um, a sort of splintering of uh, you know p- politics had, had largely moved into the the centre ground for most uh, for most wow. sort of cultures that were that were relatively advanced that were moving and uh, you know out of third world and the first world and uh, over the last what maybe five years certainly it seems to have taken a, a step backwards and, and, and a, a move away from the center all over the place and yeah i think something things like social media have, have had a massive impact and, and and as you say um this was almost a kind of precursor to, to show us what could happen yeah and and the, one of the tools that uh, they were using it Again, the countries that you mentioned, the Balkans as well, is historic, you know, rewriting history, historical revisionism. Uh, mm-hmm. So, for example, they, uh, because victimhood is political capital, 
Uh, they're all fighting over the numbers of victims. So we, we suffered more people, more deaths than you did. And no, no, we did. So, and, and this, this is ongoing and it's, it's, it's happened before. In, in Soviet Russia, where they would disappear people out of out of photographs once they fell out of favor with the regime, and it's happening now with fake news and with with social media. Uh, and the the problem is, is that how do you hold on to the truth with this acceleration of technology? It's very difficult. But but to get back to the story, no, uh, we'll, we'll return to that theme in a moment. But to get back to the why do they want this book? Is that they wanted to refurbish Croatia's and Tujman's image in the eyes of the West. They wanted to yeah. join the EU. Then, and Tujman was also, not the least of it, deathly afraid of being called to the Hague for war crimes. And had yeah. he not died in 99, I had very good confirmation from the people I spoke to at the Hague that he definitely would have been called to the, to the Hague for war crimes yeah, as part of what they call the joint criminal enterprise. It's yeah. not like he didn't pull the trigger, but he was the one in charge. So it was a, it was a PR, PR exercise, essentially. And yeah. Yeah. The, the choice of uh, an English-speaking um, individual to write this story, and an American, I guess, in particular, was a very deliberate choice. Do you uh, think that... Um, Without, without meaning to be uh, insulting on your credentials or anything like that, Joe, but do you think that they um, deliberately chose a non, uh, uh, someone who didn't have a journalistic background? Oh, I, th- I think that certainly played into it. Um, it it's, it's curious because um, the Dr. Tony that I mentioned, who was the connection between me and Yakov, the man who hired me, yeah. Uh, later told me that uh, he had saved the life of Yakov's daughter. And because of that, uh, Yakov would do whatever Dr. Tony said. And, and Dr. Tony right. knew that I was deep in debt and he did some work. He says, you hire this guy, this guy, Joe. You know, and Dr. Tony is another character in, entirely, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, like a, a Long Island guy from New York with the pinky rings, you know, and, and the, the spray right. on tan. Uh, and I mean, Dr. Like, Tony sounds suspicious. Like, it's, it's not his <laughs> real name. It's, it's just his name is Joe. But I, was, I wrote him in the book as Tony because uh, it's I was already one. There can only be one show in my story, and uh, I'm, I'm the one. I'm the guy. So, uh, but um, but the whole thing was was it was so clumsily organized by by Yakov by the creation um, regime. Uh, that uh, they had, uh, uh, they had didn't didn't do their due diligence on me, and even though, and they didn't read, they barely read the contract that they signed, which said that I had the right to uh, to to final uh, the final edit of the book, so to speak, had the final approval over what goes in, what goes out. And did you write could, the contract, or did they write the contract? Did you no, lawyers? no, did I had lawyers? my lawyer. I paid a good yeah, so deal lawyer? of money to, to make sure that that happened. A uh, uh, really good shark uh, lawyer. <laughs> so, um, so, so when I learned that, and it, it became piece by piece, it was the day before I interviewed Tujman, was the day that Croatia had uh, voluntarily, I'm using quotes here, voluntarily surrendered their war criminal suspects to the Hague. And right. so the story behind that is that like a mafia run, you know, consortium, you know, the, the Croatian government guarantee, we'll take care of your families, you go there, we're going to do everything you can to get you out of there, et cetera, et cetera. And, yeah. and that the day after they voluntarily surrendered themselves, uh, the, <clears throat> the the money that was being held back, uh, international you know, loan for Croatia was all of a sudden released. IMF. Yeah, IMF, you got it. <laughs> Funny that. Funny that. So, yeah, so um, he didn't want to be called to The Hague. He wanted to, uh, you know, be known as Croatian George Washington. And, and from the start, I said, okay, I'm going to do some research, Yakov hand because Yakov handed me these glo- glossy brochures which said, uh, you know, Tujman, Croatian George Washington, you know, uh, Croatia, you know, 
small country, big fun, you know, uh, democracy fit for a king. Only one of those is fake. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, so I went out and, and, and did cram for like a, a, a month and a half, two months, hired researchers, et cetera, et cetera, to, to get. And I was taking the job seriously. And when I got there, I said, okay, uh, let me go to these interviews. And these interviews, as I said, uh, people would just spout, you know, the talking points, couldn't get through them. So the, the information I got was more interesting and more usable from uh, a deep throat character who I called the priest. And the yeah. priest was not a real priest, but he was the fifth the highest uh, ranking government official in the Bosnian Croat government. And uh, he told me that uh, that he was against Tuđman's uh, regime. Uh, and the man that, but the man that, there's a big but here, but the man that, uh, that, basically took Tujman's orders was the president of the Bosnian Croat Federation, a man named Mati Boban. Mati Boban had a nickname. His nickname was the mobster. I'm not making yeah. this stuff up. And so the mobster <clears throat> was the one that took the orders from Tujman down the line that, that established the death camps and kept them running, even after uh, international a pressure on Tujman to disband the death camps got so great that the mobster fell on his sword and resigned so that his his leader, Tujman, could look like he was the one that you know, did the deed, all the good stuff, and the mobster was the one that did all the bad stuff. I'm really you know, <laughs> making it very simple but explanation, but it's yeah. still true. So, so uh, yeah. Just a, in order to clarify for our listeners, when we're talking about death camps here, you know, uh, what exactly are we talking about? Are we are we talking about uh, a Nazi level of uh, concentration camp where people are being systematically murdered? Uh, you know, uh, is it a prison camp? Is it was there an ethnic cleansing element where they? Murder of Muslims, you know, just to uh, spell it out for the listeners who might not These be familiar. Were, it, you can't call them death camps to the, the Croatian uh, patriots. They, they call them holding centers. Uh, but in the holding right. centers, they were malnourished, they were beaten, uh, were tortured, uh, they were raped. And the it, it, uh, it, they didn't have the ovens, okay? So uh, I think at that, that level... It's like the precursor to, like, Auschwitz when they were ghettoizing the Jews and, like, not feeding them and beating them. And the, that, it's like the step just before that, but there was still plenty of them dying in the camps. And it was not just the best camps. It was, it was the, the, the Bosnian Croats were holding up uh, the aid that was that was coming in. They're holding up the food deliveries, they're holding up gas deliveries and all this stuff. And, and so uh, it wasn't until... Uh, Tujman, and this is my opinion and the opinion of some other historians, it's not universal, but it wasn't until Tujman gained enough uh, territory in Bosnia that, and, and the international pressure got on him to be great enough that he decided, okay, I'll let, the, uh, let some of the aid through and I'll, dis- I'll, I'll tell the guys to disband the uh, camps. Uh, but that didn't stop the fighting. It, it, the fighting only stopped when uh, the uh, NATO-led group started to strategically bomb Serb positions. Uh, the Serbs then held uh, UN uh, prisoners of war, and I mean, but all the stuff is easily found in history, and you don't need me to repeat that. But behind the scenes, I can tell you that um, there was a lot of effort put into. Uh, keeping Tuchman from being called to the Hague and, and yeah. a lot of effort on, on and pressure on this book, so much so that by the time I got back, they wanted the, the book written, uh, you know, right, written, delivered right away. Uh, and it took me a while to work with my um, researcher. But in the middle of this, my, uh, the early draft of my manuscript was leaked to the president, to the president's office, to all the, the high-ranking officials there. And when I found that out, I was like was furious because the early draft had a lot of you know mistakes and facts that had to be checked and all this stuff. And and I I, I put in there the stuff that I 
all the bad stuff I found about Twitch and I was still fact checking and, yeah. and they didn't like that and so I tracked down the leak was by my researcher he didn't leak it but the person that he was working with his buddy uh, was a representative of Croatia to the United Nations he was the one that leaked it so when I spoke to this person, uh, Miles Raguse, uh, I you know was furious about this, and I, I can I can I can say now that all these conversations I had I, I recorded, uh, both officially and during the interview process, and also on all the phone calls, and so my my conversations with Yakov, my conversations with all these other people, uh, I knew I had to to have a, a record of this. Uh, yeah. because I knew they'd be coming back and be, and what they did was after I, I spoke with Yakov and said, look, I know who leaked the manuscript, uh, blah, blah, blah. He says, oh, I spoke to him. I told him, look, this is an early draft. Don't worry. You're going to write a very really good book. <laughs> so I delivered the book. And the day after I delivered the book, I got a call from Yakov. He says, oh, Joe, uh, we like the book very much, but please, please come to office tomorrow to talk. So I said, okay, here it comes, the day of reckoning, right? Because there were yeah. some things that I, I couldn't leave out in the book. So Yakov started off saying, we want you to make uh, small changes. I said, okay, what? He says, Can first I ask, I, just before you get to this, was, yeah. was there any point where you were scared for your life? As in, did you feel threatened through any of this? Like, because obviously... A random Middle Eastern man telling you to come to his office to talk about a book like it's classic <laughs> late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, well, I, was, I, was in, I was on my own turf in New York, but there were moments in, in Sarajevo uh, where I was really isolated uh, and also some moments in Zagreb. Uh, where I, I swore I, I saw the same cars following me and such, but yeah. I, didn't, I didn't receive... Um, any death threats per se, um, but a lot of that's, the, that's a big qualifier <laughs> there. That per se is doing a lot of work. I mean, well, you had a room with people who ended up being, you know, the guys in charge of death camps. I can't imagine <laughs> they were the nicest people sometimes. It was per se. It, it, it was funny because everybody knew where I was and where I was going yeah. to be. This is this is this strange thing that happened, and I didn't tell anybody. I swear I didn't. Uh, so I'm, I'm certain of that. I'm certain I was followed by who and how many people. Uh, the only, you know, I, and I even when I went to Sarajevo, you know, I didn't even tell the American embassy. It was the weekend. They weren't open. And when I got to Sarajevo, I realized, wait, nobody knows where the fuck I am. <laughs> so I started to make some calls to New York and say, if you don't hear from me by such such a date, please, you know, look into it. I mean, if you didn't get to me for a couple of days, I'm in Sarajevo. It's probably not the best way to find you anyway. <laughs> like, so, so, so fast forward then to uh, Yakov's called you up. He said, "I want you to come into the office." And say, was there any nervousness at, at that stage? Were you nervous about going into that meeting? No, not really. I had I, I had all the cards. I had gotten Why not? Paid. <laughs> I, I, had, I had gotten paid. Right. I had a signed contract. You couldn't publish it without my authorization. Okay. I was I was just, you know, um, wanted to hear and recorded what he said. So he said, first, the small changes, first the title. And I had titled the book In Tito's Shadow because I said, I said to Jack, I said, it's very descriptive of the man and the country. Mm -hmm. No, no. He said, yeah. please, said Yakov, not to mention anything of former communist time. I said, well, that'll make the book much thinner. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, he did a capper was then he says, uh, please don't cut out all the, the mention of war crimes. I said, I, you know, I can't do that. And, and I recommend that you don't because if, if you're really trying to, you know, win over the hearts and minds of the international community and of America in particular, you know, you should be forthcoming. These these things are not hidden. All, all these facts are out in the open. Yeah. Been, at this point, there have been, you know, about a dozen books written about the Bosnian Wars and a couple of documentaries. Yeah. The BBC had a great documentary about it. Uh, and, and I want, said I couldn't, I couldn't do it. 
And if you want people to take the book seriously, then you're going to have to you're going to have to acknowledge this stuff, or yeah, I mean, it's nobody's going to pay any attention to any of the rest of it. Yeah, it's only going to look like a propaganda piece if you well, don't mention the any of the bad things. The problem was who was running this campaign, okay? Uh, yeah. The campaigns, particularly for the book and for all video documentation, was Yakov. And Yakov was a known propagandist for many years. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, I gave him a nickname. I call him the Lenny Riefen style of Croatia, but without the talent. <laughs> without the talent. His films were, right. were very dreadful. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, but this is what happened he said he would take me to all of these government officials and thinking I would just write what they said and put it in there and he says one day he comes to me uh, I'm at the uh, the hotel in Zagreb Palace Hotel and uh, I'm looking at the buffet table and there's there's beef and there's pork and there's wine and there's sausage and there's pr- it's a typical Balkan breakfast right so I'll get in there and, and that, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. You think your Scottish have got the heavy meals? Well, let me tell you. Uh, there and and Yakov comes in and says, Joe, you know, today we meet the president. I said, Oh, today? He said, Yes, but first we have lunch at the mass graves. Come. So he drags <laughs> me in to this his waiting uh, driver, his black uh, sedan, and we're driving at like a hundred miles an hour to the airport. Get into a to a helicopter, fly over Vukovar. We, we see all the destruction uh, that the Serb bombing did, and then land and get into the DMZ zone. So we had to go out, take one bus to the to the middle of the DMZ zone, get out what's where the border of the Serbia is, get out, go into another bus, go to the the mass graves where they're having a ceremony. Uh, and the ceremony was uh, being covered by all of Yakov's camera people, and they were doing the ceremony, and I didn't want to be part of it. So I was, I was backing up, trying to get out of camera range. And as yeah. I backed up further and further, there's this, there's this soldier with this, with this you know, M16. He starts yelling at me, and he starts gesturing to me. And I think he wants me to go into the, to the direction he's gesturing. Like, so I go there, and he starts yelling louder and louder. All of a sudden, Yakov comes in, grabs me, pulls me back, says, No, Joe, <laughs> you, you want to stay away from landmines. <laughs> That's good advice. Yes. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the, the propaganda campaign was, was really ham-fisted. Uh, so I, you know, I tried to be as truthful as I could. Uh, and... Uh, in there, I, I you know met some really wonderful people who were working on uh, on reconciliation, and mm-hmm. uh, and I'm I'm planning to go back there and do a documentary, uh, right. and yeah, documentary is so. going to be uh, I'm going to confront the people that uh, that were behind the, the propaganda campaign, and then trace the events that happened afterwards with the eye towards. The uh, the dangers of of revising history, historical revisionism, uh, as as a as a weapon, how it's been weaponized yeah. to move uh, hearts and minds and to uh, claim victimhood and claim more political capital and to win more elections, gain more power, and hold on to that power. Uh, do you expect to have the same amount of access to the people that you had when you were working essentially in the nicest possible way as a government propagandist? Like, it's a lot easier to get access to a lot of these people than it is when you pull them up for it 20 no, years they're, later. They're, they're, they're those who are still alive, uh, I think, would be you know happy to go on the record about that. And I just confirmed with my Bosnian uh, producer today that Yakov would be, because he's such a, a camera uh, whore, he would uh, <laughs> be happy to go on the camera with me. I mean, they want to. I want to give everybody a chance to to speak the truth as they see it or as they're saying yeah. it, uh, and uh, to uh, you know to to show all sides. I want to speak to the the two um, in, indicted war criminals, Bosnian and Croat war criminals, who were recently released from The Hague, and talk to them. And there is yeah. a, um, and again, there are people that are still working. As my Bosnian producer told me quite well, she says, the war has not stopped. 
the bullets and the bombs are stopped, but the fighting mm-hmm. continues. It's continuing by other means. It's continuing by propaganda. It's continuing by historical revisionism. It's continuing over the fight over who gets to tell their story in the history books. To this day, the school children in Bosnia and Herzegovina have three different sets of books one for the Bosnian Croats, one for the Bosnian Muslims, and one for the Bosnian Serbs, each telling their own version of history. And this is yeah. a really dangerous path, but I am, I am, I'm, I am really delighted to, to know and, and really looking forward to meeting the people who are working for uh, reconciliation, trying to be, by bringing children together, uh, by bringing yeah. different ethnic groups together, uh, and working on transitional justice and working on establishing on the record among all the groups, all the countries, historical fact as fact. Yeah. Well, that's uh, something that we're, we're, we're very much looking forward to being able to watch. Can, can I ask what what was the what eventually happened uh, with with the the book? Then was it ever released? No, <laughs> never released. Uh, and I'm thinking of publishing it, but it's it's kind of it's kind of in it's dated because it hasn't changed since 1997. Yeah. Uh, what I did write was I wrote a memoir about my experience, and uh, it's, my memoir is called Good. "Balkanized at Sunrise." Uh, and, and that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, it's, that's available on Amazon as paperback and as an ebook. "Balkanized at Sunrise," so I appreciate that. Uh, and the documentary you can learn more about that. So go into my Twitter. I'm at Joe Trip J O E T R I P. My website is also joetrip.com, and uh, you can see a little preview of, uh, of the documentary, a little three-minute teaser video to get an idea how have this. And if you are in a country that, uh, like the United States, uh, want to make a donation, we take donations to anybody, anybody in any country. Uh, I know that in America, there are tax, uh, you know, you can get a tax uh Exemption, that. exemption. Thank you for prompting me on the words. <laughs> See the moment I'm having. Uh, you can make your tax exempt donations uh, all, all at, at uh, Joe Trip on Twitter, and uh, any contributions, large or small, would be greatly appreciated. Uh, but it's it's really it's a story where you expand the story, not just you know. For, focused on the Balkans, but they're focused on all, as Jerry was saying, all these uh, other nationalist uh, populist movements that are happening now and, uh, and yeah. the dangers of, uh, of propaganda and historical revisionism and the people who are fighting against it and, and who could use support. Well, see, that's what yeah. I would find interesting if you got to publish a book, because it actually doesn't suffer from historical revisionism. Like, it's almost a historical piece in its own right. It's something that came just after the war, and it comes from the mouth of babes, if you will. You'd like, it came from the mouth of the people who were there. Granted, maybe not all entirely truthful, what they've said, but it's still historically accurate to what they were selling at the time rather than 20 years later, and like that being revised to make it seem a bit... PC or safer or more <laughs> saleable. Well, well, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have the benefit of 25 years hindsight, you know. Well, yes. speaking of like, you know, PC, you, what what I didn't speak about uh, during this podcast was all my misadventures with some of the women in Croatian and Bosnian women I was trying to seduce. Uh, so those are the real fun parts of the book that people really uh, – Crap a hold on to. Uh, but you get a bit of your net as part of your documentary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am planning, and I'm going to announce this now. I'm planning to to try to reconnect with the the, the two women that I tried to seduce. I didn't actually. I, was, I wasn't really successful, well, <laughs> as, successful. As, a, as a propagandist or as a <laughs> as a Don Juan there. But uh, coming back from there, I did meet my my current wife, who's a Brazilian. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not lost cause, you know. Go to a terrifying moment in Croatia when you meet a twenty three year old American Croatian child that say resembles you. Are you my daddy? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that, that didn't happen. That, that that certainly didn't happen. But uh, 
Um, it, so, was, uh, it was just, you can imagine a, a guy, a recently divorced guy, you know, getting a chance to meet foreign women. He's got an American passport. He says, oh, yeah, this is my entryway, man. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> Like you know, up, yeah. situation. You were meeting the president, and you know you had essentially the key to the country. You had access to everyone and anywhere and anything. It's an almost semi rock star lifestyle without anyone knowing who you are. It's just such such a bizarre story. Like <laughs> and, you know, it's so strange. When, when, I'm not. I'm not going to lie. But when we when we received the initial email from you to begin with, I read it. It was like this. This guy's clearly fucking off his head. You know, this this can't possibly have happened. And the more research I did it, I was like, oh no, this is this is a actual thing. And then the thing is, when you look at the back catalog of where you were before in the states and stuff, so like the music video stuff, and like like I said did the stuff with Jeff Buckley and like stuff with Jeff Henson and like a whole pile of things where like <laughs> like it's just so bad to like it's left it alive. You've left the line. I, I had a, yeah, I call a peripatetic, you know, a career that doesn't have a, you know, a trajectory, it certainly didn't have the trajectory that I had dreamed of when I was 15. But uh, I did get a chance to write and record, uh, perform a song with Jeff Buckley. I did get to work as a production assistant for Jim Hudson and work with the Muppets people. And, and I did get a chance to, um, you know, do music videos with uh, Lou Reed and a lot of other uh, artists. I, I did get a chance to work with a lot of uh, performance artists and musicians, painters, uh, authors. Uh, and it has been, uh, and I'm still looking forward to the future. I don't look back at this stuff. It's my, my, I have two young daughters. My daughter, my youngest daughter, who's like 13, says to me, you know, I'm, I'm telling her, uh, oh, you know, I know this guy that uh, you're interested in, you know, whether it's, it's like a Jeff Buckley music she's listening to or something. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, you know everybody, Daddy. You know, you have a story <laughs> about everybody. You know, they're, and they're interested, but not really that much. <laughs> I know that war criminal. <laughs> I, yeah, I hung out with the war criminals. Oh, no, not that story again, Daddy. <laughs> oh, look, look at that guy. <laughs> Listen, well, uh, you're the only ones who listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I uh, I think I think there's a there's a, a lot more people that are going to be uh, interested in your story after after hearing this. And I would I've read the book. I would highly recommend it. It's a very uh, enjoyable read. So uh, if if you're out there and listening, pick it up on Amazon, give it a read, and uh, and please do donate to Joe's documentary because uh, we we all want to see it. Oh, thank yeah, you very much. I I really appreciate it. It's, it's great talking with you guys and. Uh, Let's keep the dialogue going, shall we? Always a pleasure. We'll yeah. to try and meet up when you're over in the UK. Awesome. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, yeah, thanks thanks very much for, for coming on the show, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.